because hello there Yvonne do I'm so sorry I'm running behind good morning how are you Sonia? I'm very well thank you everybody good morning Philip I do apologize I'm running behind but we're not going to cut short this item don't you worry we're gonna we're gonna explore it properly okay so on your screen, you have Yvonne Hartley and Philip Walker, and they are from the Jeremy Bamber Innocence Campaign. And I've uh, talked with them this week. They've sent me a stash of research information. I have been like just for the last 48 hours, taking it all in. And uh, I, when I dared to say the other day, well, look, it, Let's just give some background, first of all, for anybody who doesn't know. Jeremy Bamber was convicted um, in the 80s of the murder of his adoptive parents, his sister and her twin children, her twin boys. And he has pleaded his innocence from the get go. He's never, ever waved on that. And these people here have been fighting his cause, Yvonne for 11 years, Philip for five, six years. And when I dared to say the other day, well, if he is innocent, if he's been, been behind for 37 years, the least we can do is give it an airing. And Yvonne leapt on me and said, there's no if involved in this. We have the evidence, mm -hmm. we have the proof, and we are now hoping that the, uh, the review board um, will now refer it back to the Court of Appeal Right, so 37 years inside, start wherever you would like to. I, you know, obviously the Crown's case is that he's guilty. He's got a full life tariff now. And uh, what is your position? Philip, kick us off a little bit. Yeah, hi, Sonia. Morning. Well, the, the, the most frequent question we get asked by people who are not familiar with the case when they learn that we're working to prove Jeremy's innocence is, well, if he's not guilty, why was he convicted? And the answer to that is pretty straightforward. It's because all the evidence that was presented against him at his trial, uh, which, um, which was, was either wrong, misinterpreted or fabricated. And if you add to that the fact that the judge at the trial uh, had clearly decided for whatever reason uh, that Jeremy was guilty uh, and made that very clear to the jury, uh, you have all the ingredients for one of the worst and probably one of the longest running miscarriages of justice in English legal history. However, as a result of the partial disclosure of evidence since the trial, uh, we're now in a position to undermine every single aspect of the prosecution's case, whether that be the evidence regarding the ballistics, the call logs that show that Neville Bamber, Jeremy's father, made a call to police at 326, which the police hid. Um, the fact that uh, the Essex police have multiple pieces of evidence that showed that Sheila Caffell, Jeremy's sister, was alive in White House Farm after the first officers arrived at the scene at around 3.50 in the morning. Uh, and that evidence includes a 999 call that she made from the farmhouse at 6.09 in the morning, which again was hidden by the police. Now, these two issues are important amongst a host of others. They particularly are important because if either of those two phone calls by Neville or by Sheila was made, then there is absolutely no doubt that Jeremy is innocent because it would have been logistically impossible for him to have uh, committed the shootings, I, which is I, what, sorry, we, we, which is why Essex police obviously hid those particular pieces of evidence amongst a great deal of other items as well. So J Jeremy's un been unfortunate enough to be faced with a, a toxic mix of three different parties. Uh, the police officers who were running the second investigation into the tragedy, uh, his relatives for financial motives, and Julie Mugford, his jilted ex-girlfriend, uh, and all of those three parties for different reasons desperately wanted him to be guilty. And they worked very effectively together to manipulate or create the evidence um, that then ensure that he was convicted, uh, whilst hiding anything that showed that he was innocent. I should say, of course, at this point, everybody involved, including the police and CPS, deny 
any of these mm-hmm. things. The police deny that they withheld any documents. But let's actually talk about those documents, though. We are talking about a phenomenal amount of material, right? So, Yvonne, you have been assisting Jeremy with his research for 11 years. You've waded through 375,000 case documents. And you both say there are at least 4 million documents associated with the case which, re- which remain undisclosed. We're talking phenomenal well, figures here. We absolutely are. We know these 4 million documents because the documents we have at disclosed list that those exist. Uh, it's just been, you know, I mean, there's a team of us. It's not just Philip and I. There's uh, Sarah who founded the campaign and Emma and Lorna and Heidi. There's a whole team of people. And we've meticulously gone through this evidence, predominantly myself with Jeremy, and it's from this material we can prove exactly what's missing. So when we approach Essex Police or the CPS for this material, they just flatly refuse to give it us. They don't deny it exists. They just flatly refuse. They won't allow us. We have a team of scientists. They refuse to allow them into the forensic archive to look at the material that they hold. We also know documents were destroyed. I mean, in 1996, the Essex Police admit themselves that Special Branch destroyed all the forensic exhibits. So Sheila's nightdress and the bullets all got destroyed. That prevents us from being able to examine them. And we also know that there are three court orders in place which have ordered the Essex Police to release material. Why are they ignoring the courts? That's a very good question. It, it seems that Essex Police have basically put themselves above the law because these instructions from the court were very clear that they must disclose all evidence relating to the case. There there was no conditionality to that. It was all evidence. Uh, And Essex, please admit they are still not disclosing uh, evidence. We have written records that they say, yes, we acknowledge there is undisclosed material, but we're just not giving it to you. Uh, Well, it it has implications more widely than Jeremy's case. Obviously, it impacts on him. But if we live in a system where the police can, in effect, put themselves outside the law, that that is very concerning. Right. And especially because there are so many question marks about the investigation. We're talking about the fact that they were wrong footing right from the get-go, weren't they? The crime scene was immediately disturbed. There was a dog in the house who would obviously could also disturb the crime scene, right? Well, the, dog, the dog didn't actually go in the house, Sonia. The dog was outside. But we know that police right. training exercises were conducted. That's documented. What does that mean? Well, after the, the deceased were all discovered, then, because it was a recent development, was the firearms unit in Essex at that time, once everybody had been discovered, they then called more firearms officers in to do like, reconstruction to go through the scene, because this was huge. And this was the biggest case that you know, these firearms officers had had yeah. to look at. Yeah, they knew but it, didn't they? They did, but we can prove what they did. They deny moving anything apart from a stool in the house. But we can prove that we're even moving the bodies. And, you know, it's took a lot of uh, analysis to get to that point. But we've, we've, it's actually there. It's in black and white. We're not speculating. We're not saying um, we believe this happened. We know this happened. The yeah. documents we have had disclosed prove it happened. Mm. But now, the other... Yes, sorry. go on, Philip. I, go I, I was on. just going to say the other key point about the um, firearms team and just jumping back to your, your previous point, there, there was actually a dog in the house. I think Yvonne was referring to the police dog. Ah. But there, there was the small shih tzu that belonged to, That's to June, right. ba- June Bamba, so th- that was right. But going back to the firearms team, wh- when this exercise was being conducted, we, we believed that they were lifting the rifle on and off Sheila's body, and the gun accidentally discharged. And that is how the second wound to Sheila was created. Now, obviously, this was quite embarrassing for Essex Police, but in the context of the first investigation, which said it was a murder-suicide, it didn't particularly matter. So they covered it up, basically. But when the second investigation got underway, instead of saying, well, to, to the officers conducting the second investigation, well, this wound was caused by us, they just kept quiet. 
And at trial, the fact that Sheila had two wounds was very, very prejudicial to Jeremy yeah. because it, it is far less likely, although not unknown, that people commit suicide by two shots. Yeah, absolutely. And also, um, so the there were police at loggerheads about this, right? So the first inquiry was Thomas Taft Jones, and he was absolutely adamant this is a murder suicide. Sheila Caffell has history for it. Let's give a little bit of background to Sheila, first of all. Sheila obviously was, was she a manic schizophrenic? She was paranoid schizophrenic. Paranoid yeah, she'd schizophrenic. Been, she'd been uh, treated for that. She'd been hospitalised on two occasions with the condition. And the last time was in March 1985. And she was in for a number of weeks. But in July 1985, her medication was reduced incorrectly. So instead of the 200 milligrams of antipsychotic medication she'd been having every two weeks, it was Mr. Misprescribed, and she was given 100 milligrams to last the month. Now, I'm absolutely convinced that that was a major contributory factor to what happened. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, is that it, it, it did make a lot of sense. And it, it isn't, even though it is rare to have two bullet wounds, obviously, it isn't. It isn't unheard of, as I think the the coroner had said, um, and uh, but certainly somebody had uh, within the case had said this is this is achievable. But Stan Jones, who was part of the second inquiry, he was absolutely determined from the outset that this was Jeremy Bamba, wasn't he? And 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 he went yes. behind his boss's back repeatedly to prove this, right? Absolutely. Uh that's right. I mean, in the ITV drama, White House Farm, Taft Jones, the original senior investigating officer, was portrayed as a sort of bumbling idiot. Who, yes. You know, sort of crashed through the scene, jumped to conclusion and just stuck with it, regardless of what other people said or the evidence. But in fact, that, that is entirely misleading. Taft Jones had a number of very good reasons to know that it was a murder-suicide. For instance, he knew about the rifle in the window uh, that was seen by two officers before the raid team went in. Uh, and that rifle was subsequently found on Sheila's body. Now, the only way that it could have got from the window to her body was if she moved it. Yeah. So that in itself said it was a murder-suicide. Mm. But other factors were he knew about the source of the second shot, which we've just discussed. He knew there was a suicide note, which the police covered up. Uh, and and the fact, that fact didn't emerge till 2002. Ironically, when Stan Jones mentioned it to the Metropolitan Police Inquiry, uh, he also knew that, as we mentioned earlier, that, that Sheila had made a 999 call from the house at 609 uh, and that the police had been in conversation with her at around 515. And also the final point that made up his mind was that Sheila was seen in the kitchen by the raid team when they first went in. So what we believe happened was she was lying either comatose or asleep or whatever in the kitchen beside her father. And when the raid team took 20 seconds to knock the back door down because it was firmly locked and a very you know, substantial door, she woke up, ran upstairs, took the rifle from the window and tragically committed suicide. So all of those reasons were why Taft Jones said it was a murder-suicide. Uh, and in hindsight, we can see that he was entirely correct. Right. And let us not forget that the portrayal of Jeremy was problematic from the get go. OK, the obviously this had all the ingredients of a tabloid drama, which they loved it, obviously. And so Jeremy was portrayed as and in fact, Philip, one of the things that you said to me was that this is a problematic or a difficult campaign because it's a hard sell on the doorstep to say, actually, this man that you believe is a child killer is innocent. And part of that is because of the public perception of him is that he's arrogant, he was entitled, he was a psychopath, he was a narcissist, that he joked about these situations, that he was only interested in the money. There were other stories such as he coldly had the, the June's dog put down. Was there truth to that? No, certainly not about the dog. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as you say, this media persona that was created for him was very, very negative. But the key point to remember about that is all the information they were using, the press were using to draw this picture of him came from interested parties, such as the relatives, who were all pushing for Jeremy to be charged and convicted. 
Yeah. So it, it was a hugely unbalanced view of what he's like. And he, he's actually nothing like how he was portrayed. And we cannot forget the role of the relatives, in particular mm. Anne Eaton, who now I believe lives in White Hart House Farm. She inherited mm. everything, or at least the uh, Bow Flowers did. Um, and Anne Eaton had a crucial, well, a crucial role. It was really down to her and Julie Mugford, the ex-girlfriend that he was convicted. It was Anne Eaton who discovered the silencer, who first raised concerns that it was Jeremy and not a murder-suicide. Um, so she was actually crucial to this, right? She was also, there were also issues between her and Jeremy prior to that, weren't there? They had they had previously got along. They were sort of co-running the caravan park that belonged to the Bambas. And then they had fallen out because I understood that Anne was angry because Neville Bamba was going to be um, off, giving her some money. And after conversations with Jeremy, Jeremy, that offer was withdrawn. And there was a long-standing animosity between the pair of them and she is absolutely central to it and it was also Anne of course who discovered the issue well, not only the silencer but the issue about the kitchen window whereby there was uh, a loose handle that because one of the things they said was if it was somebody else how could they get into a property that is locked from the inside and Anne said no actually there's a loose window handle that when you open the window and slam it like that the handle comes down and it locks so that's how he did it so and of course absolutely integral to the whole conviction there's i mean that's all proven that's yeah. all a proven fact right well the the both as and the eatons were both equally culpable i mean and it was Anne's brother that discovered a silencer in the gun cupboard on the 10th of august well that was the second one actually that had been found the police had found one on the day um, the windows issue is very important because if yeah. Jeremy had no way in, then Jeremy didn't need to get out. And we can absolutely prove that the evidence that was shown to the jury about the window catch, as you say, not only Anne, but the police were saying that this catch, which had just been replaced in July, all the dodgy catches had been replaced at the house it had um, decorators in, and so um, that's a month before the tragedy. A month so, before. Because the tragedy yeah. obviously was August the 7th. And so you're saying a month before it had been replaced. All the window catches, any broken ones, any faulty ones have been replaced in the house. So what happened was they needed Jeremy to be able to get in that house. They knew he couldn't have gone in through the bolted doors. So then they turned their attention to the windows. There was police officers with Anne Eaton present climbing in and out of the windows slamming them, trying all different ways, and they settled for the, the kitchen window as the escape window. But the jury was shown a photograph of the window from an angle. So it appeared that the catch wasn't fully closed. So the police said that the catch could only be closed by banging it to a seven o'clock position. But the jury didn't know and was available in the courtroom, which we got a few years ago from the court, is a second photograph of the window from head on that shows that catch is absolutely closed. It's vertical, it's, it is closed. But also there's a secondary catch on the window sill that, that could not go onto its peg on from the outside. It's one of those old fashioned latches that you have to push and it runs along the window sill and goes onto a retaining peg. So that was closed. And we know that that was closed because Taff Jones said in written evidence that all the windows were closed and all the latches were secure. So how was that latch open then? Because we've, you couldn't... We've been sold a different version of events. What you're Don't telling us it, is completely different to what people know. They're kicking off in the comments. A lot of people are like, wait, I mean... Some people haven't even heard the story before, which is extraordinary. Oh no, Lugabugs, you're in Denmark, aren't you? Or oh, Holland, sorry, forgive me. Um, Esther says, I believe it's a case of another innocent man in prison or an innocent man or woman um, in prison for life. Absolutely disgusting. Uh, Chris said, yes, the inspector in the drama came over as an, as an idiot. Well, that was deliberate. Um, <laughs> and absolutely. And uh, uh, yes, it, it now, Defer says, what a pointless character assassination. And, um, and you know, the thing is, is that he, his character, there's no doubt about it, Jeremy Bamber 
his character was assassinated. There's no getting around that. He was a 24 year old lad at the end of the day, right? <laughs> Which is the same age as my daughter, right? So we were all forgetting that. And, and we had so much, it was this whole idea that he faked sadness at the funeral and all those different things. Now, Julie Mugford is really, again, like Anne Eaton, integral to this case. Julie Mugford was his girlfriend of, I believe, two years. And there's no getting away from the fact that Julie Mugford was in her own right a troubled character. She clearly had emotional issues. She had attacked him a number on a number of occasions. Um, and uh, she was an obsessive character who was frightened of him leaving her. They were like chalk and cheese. It was a bizarre Absolutely coupling in enough. the first place. Um, um, and Julie's vision, Julie's vision was to be Mrs. Bamba. She's already picked out she wanted to live. There was a lot of properties involved in the case. I mean, there was a lot of land and properties. And her vision, she'd already said to people she wanted to live at Vaulty Manor, which was Jeremy's grandmother's home, and that she even went around once saying they were engaged. They'd never been engaged. Um, she tried to smother him with a pillow and said, if I can't have you, no one else is going to have you. And to be honest, she made all these stories up and the police knew that her tales were wrong. She said that Jeremy had hired a hitman and paid him £2,000. That's right. To murder the family. The police knew that was wrong from the 8th of September because they interviewed the so-called hitman. He had a cast iron alibi. Yeah, he but was with one of his mistresses, Bill. wasn't he? Yeah, but they still presented that evidence in court as though it had happened. And it's, you know, it's just unbelievable. Her drug offences, which she had numerous, were never told to the jury. They were told that she had um, criminal activity because she committed a checkbook fraud. But all the while, the jury had told Jeremy had corrupted her. Jeremy had no knowledge of this checkbook fraud, but it wasn't a singular checkbook fraud. As yeah. the jury were told, yeah. there was at least 13 checkbook offences because wow. the total of the offence wouldn't what had to be substantially more than one because of the check guarantee card being used. Right. In 1985, it was only for £50. Pounds. So, you but know, we know there was a lot more. Basically, on, Ju Philip. Julie Mudford was a one-woman crime wave. Um, right. But but all, all but the key point is that all of those sins were absolved by the CPS yes. on condition she gave evidence against Jeremy. Right. And she she was training to be a teacher, and at that time, if you had a criminal conviction, you could not be a teacher. So as well as her liberty, you know, possibly certainly her career would have gone out the window. Uh, and then, of course, we have the matter of the her selling her story to the news of the I world. I was just going to come to that. So that is true. Yeah, that yeah, she, true. yeah. Was that, that, that the day of the conviction? The day yeah. she was waiting in a hotel room with Stan Jones and another police officer called Bernard. And as soon as the verdict came through, she was interviewed uh, and also provocative photographs were taken of her. And that was uh, published in the news of the world. She was paid £25,000. Yeah, that was, a, that was a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money now, but back then she bought a two bedroom flat in London with that. So wow. that gives, gives you an idea of... The condition of that interview was on a guilty verdict. So had, it, had Jeremy been found not guilty, she yeah. wouldn't have got that interview. She wouldn't have got the £25,000. Yeah, you, you, I think you're waking people up here. Uh, Charlie says, innocent, innocent, innocent country boy says, this is almost like another story, not like we were told. <laughs> well, yes. Chris Absolutely, says, it's another story. It is another story. Chris says he was certainly demonised. Declan says, I always thought he was guilty from everything I read and heard. And wow. Um, and uh, Five Nine says, I remember believing the newspapers at the time. I am more cautious now. Absolutely. Um, and uh, this is horrendous, Jangia. Yes, because look, I'm going to say if, please don't tell me off, uh, Yvonne, but just if this man is innocent, that means almost 40 years of his life has been spent inside. He's lost his inheritance. He's been demonized. And there were other things you told me. They gave him initially 25 years. And then Douglas Hurd, the then Home Secretary, extended it to a full life tariff. And they That's didn't right. even tell him for about five, six years. Is that correct? That's correct. They didn't tell Jeremy till 1994. And it's just appalling the whole of Jeremy's case 
is wrong. From the evidence we've got that Sheila was alive in the house, there was lights going on and off, curtains opening and closing, as well as the other factors that's, that Phillips mentioned. You know, the suicide note that they hid. Why would they hide that? Yeah. You know, it just makes no sense. Was that because... in the Bible? No, it was no. another one. It was another one. And it said, I mean, Stan Jones, we only found it a couple of years ago in the documentation. And Stan Jones said that it said, I've just killed myself. So it's like, couldn't be any clearer. But yeah, and it's it's listed on the homes of, um, the police have a homes data computer system, which in which there is their sort of reference point for documents. And we've got some of those indexes and it lists on there. It lists on a side note. But they I won't mean, be yours. It's extraordinary. It's literally extraordinary. I mean, the, the, the people are right in the comments. What you're saying is literally a different story to what we've been told, right? When I when I put on my social media yesterday that I was interviewing you, I had some inbox messages from people saying, really? You really, really want to be like supporting a child killer? And that's the thing. It's not a case of supporting or not. It's about raising this issue up because these are not on your screen are not idiots, right? These are people who have been through documentation that so many of us have not seen. And they they have the evidence. They stand by absolutely what they've said. The, I'm looking at the your submission to um, the CCRC, which of course, if nobody, if people don't know, it is the Criminal Cases Review Commission. And obviously you need them to review it in order to then refer it back to the Court of Appeal. And your issues are, are clear. And that is there's the silencers, the telephone, calls, the integrity of the scene, all of the three things that we've mentioned, the window at White House Farm, we've mentioned that, the issue of Sheila, she was very deeply unwell, and there is no getting away from that, and she wasn't medicated as she needed to be, and there's no getting away from that. Photographic issues, um, what are the photographic issues? Well, the, the, oh, sorry. no, disclosure, sorry, we yeah. don't speak for that. Yeah, well, what, one of the main ones is around the, the subject of the two moderators, which people may have heard sort of reference to. Uh, and they might be thinking to themselves, well, you know, does it really matter how many moderators there were uh, uh, at the scene? But the, the, the fact is, yes, it does. Because the police, the main planks of the prosecution case were built around three different issues, two of which related to the moderator. They said that there was blood found on the moderator, which belonged to Sheila and Sheila alone, and that there was also paint on the end of this same moderator that had right. come from a struggle in the kitchen between Jeremy and his father. Now, we know that, in fact, there were two moderators, one which had blood on it, the other one which eventually acquired some paint on it. And by a sleight of hand, the police conflated the two into saying there was only one. And we think they did that because they believed that a jury wouldn't accept that two different moderators had been used in the shootings, which you know is probably true. They wouldn't have accepted that. But a further thing to say is that, in fact, we know that there was no moderator involved at all. That This moderator is a complete red herring. We have substantial uh, reports from US pathologists who looked at all the evidence and said unanimously, we had three of them, that no moderator was involved. And in fact, if people want to look at this issue, there's a very good video on YouTube um, from Mark Williams Thomas from 2011 uh, called Bamba, The New Evidence, where our ballistic expert, Philip Boyce, gives a, a really clear demonstration using a pig carcass of what a wound with a moderator and without look like and you can clearly see comparing it to the crime scene photos that there was no moderator on but it's not, so sorry, it's, not, on, it's not just that though i mean the the paint that they said was on the end of one of the silences wasn't there until september it was wasn't recorded by any scientists who examined silences we can prove the examined too with multiple ways of doing that and then what the police did is merge the exhibit reference numbers and created a new exhibit reference numbers. So all that the reports from one and the other were, as Philip said, conflated together. But we can prove the scratches under the mantelpiece that they said caused the paint on the end of the silencer. 
were not there on the 7th of August. The paint was not on the silence on the 7th of August and the blood that they found inside the other silencer wasn't exclusive to Sheila, as the jury was told. We now know that that was also an, an exact match, not just the blood group, but the enzyme groups was an exact match to the uncle, Robert Beaufort, That's and correct. the jury yeah. didn't get to hear it. Which is phenomenal. At the very least, this is a case that needs to be re-examined. At the very least, because what you're saying is so, it's so vital. We can't have miscarriages of justice and we've had too many, haven't we? You know, obviously. And it, this has to be examined. People are like in shock in the comments, which I thought they would be. Um, Crow says, we need this shouting more and more so they have to listen, even if through sheer force of public demand um, and uh, uh, tampering, that's a crime in itself. Yes, absolutely. And Angie says they can't keep ignoring this. More the people know, surely they can't keep it bur buried. Ricky says 100% the case needs overturning. Um, so, I mean, just so much. I mean, many I mean, people... We've, we've only been able to touch very yes, briefly yes. on a few of the issues. I mean, the whole case is wrong. And everything that people have been told in the past is wrong. And we can prove it's wrong from the documentation. I mean, you know, if there's anything that... We'd, we'd found that didn't support us. It's like we'd say, oh, well, there's this, you know, what is this? But everything that we've found supports Jeremy's story. We aren't cherry picking. We're going through everything meticulously. And the evidence absolutely 100% categorically shows that Jeremy is innocent. The actions of the police, the actions of Julie Mugford and their relatives, who even went changing wills before Jeremy was even a suspect, in order to disinherit him from his grandmother's estate. And she eventually got the Bamber estate, so they were paid to the grandmother. Unbeknown to Jeremy, they'd already disinherited him from his grandmother's estate. So, you know, it's like they had motive. Yeah, that's People and had motive. But obviously, we're not here to accuse anybody else anyway, but but you know, they're it was a toxic mix, as you say. It was, it was you know, there were there were very, very good reasons. And this has been shown anyway, why all these like three groups of people, the police, Julie Mugford, the relatives, all had a reason to support each other in their belief that uh, Jeremy was guilty. So look, how can people support the campaign? If you would like to support us, we have a website. So it's www jeremy We have a Facebook group, Jeremy Bamber Justice Group. Please come and join us, find out the facts. And we also have a series of podcasts, a new one released every Wednesday, um, which called Jeremy Bamber White House Farm Podcasts. They're available on all the streaming platforms and YouTube. And we also have Twitter accounts, which are at Bamber Tweets, at Free Bamber Now and at Jeremy Bamber Facebook. So, you know, please just, and if anybody has any questions, ask us. Absolutely, and I Make did say that right at the beginning of the show because the thing is about these two on our screen is they are so certain about their evidence. They are prepared to answer any questions live. So if you have any in these final few minutes, please, oh yes, I will absolutely, Crone, I'll put all of the links um, in the description to the Facebook and everything. Sean says, this is incredible. The case must be looked at. This man may be innocent, coming on 40 years in prison. Um, and uh, Chris will look this up. I mean, people, I will support this as country boy. I mean, the thing is, is that it was really good for you to come on. I'm so grateful for you both coming on because it's really important. Oh, I just important. appreciate this opportunity. I mean, not, it's fantastic. Not at all, not we at all. We need to shout from the rooftops about Jeremy's innocence. And the more that people realize that they've, the public have been deceived for over 36 years. The story the public have been told is incorrect. It is wrong and they need to be told the truth. Right. And we need to shout from the rooftops the truth. And that's well, what we're doing. We have a message directly from Jeremy in prison, which I'd like to read out to our viewers. It says, I am very grateful to you, Sonia, for giving myself and the campaign team this opportunity to make our case to your audience. 
I am really enthusiastic about our submissions to the Criminal Cases Review Commission this time. I know that they are taking a long time to come to a decision and have let me down in the past, but the fact is we've got a huge amount of fresh evidence they have never seen before. I think that this new evidence and the proof of the existence of all of the non-disclosed evidence, which shows my innocence, will enable them to make a positive decision on referring my case to the Court of Appeal. Once that has been done, I firmly believe that the Court of Appeal will have to acknowledge the weight and quality of the evidence of my innocence and overturn my conviction. I think this will now happen fairly quickly, and I am confident that the CCRC will make the right decision on a referral very soon. That is a message directly from Jeremy Bamber in prison. And, uh, and you know, as he says, he's grateful that we've highlighted it. And I am grateful to these two on the screen. These people have nothing to gain. They're not being paid to do this. They're donating their time voluntarily for years. And uh, so certain are they in this man's innocence. They are, you know, they're prepared to put themselves in the, in the line of fire from trolls and haters, of course, who will say the most savage things about these people. But the fact is, is that they have their evidence, which is why they're here today, because I'm not just going to let anybody come on and say this man is innocent. These people have done their work and they deserve to be heard. Any of you like Thank to say you. a final word before we go? Yeah, don't, don't just take our word for this. A lot of the evidence you can find on our website. So go and look at it, you know, consider it yourself and come to your own conclusion. But we are very don't. confident that if people do that, they will come to the same conclusion that we have. And if you can't find what you're looking for on the website, uh, please listen to the podcast. Each one is about a specific area or person involved in the case. Every single thing, every quote, everything is from case documents. We have, there's no speculation. There's no jumping to conclusions. And please ask us questions. Please just contact us. There's a contact page on the website and just contact us and ask us. Right. We have nothing to hide. The truth, the truth is the truth. Yeah, well, um, I'm telling you, the support here is phenomenal. Sean, Free oh, Bamba, Crone, blessed be Jeremy Bamba. Let's get behind this big time, many avenue. Yes, Chris, excellent information. Hope this appeal works. Human creative, bless you, Jeremy Bamba. You will fly free again and have the history log amended with the truth. Sean says, put the podcast on BNT. Yeah, we're going to, and we're also going to put... Uh, this interview as a separate film on BNT because we think it's so vital that people hear what's been saying. Put it this way, if it was one of your loved ones uh, suffering this miscarriage of justice for 40 years, you'd be out there screaming, wouldn't you? So on that note, I want to say thank you very much to Yvonne Hartley, Philip Walker from the Jeremy Bamba is Innocent campaign. Thank you so much, you two. Please come back and join us again and hopefully update us at the Court of Appeal are looking into this. We would love to, Sonia. Thank you so much to all, all your viewers. And Pleasure. To yourself. Thank you. Take good care of yourself. Pleasure. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.